Thanks a bunch. Want a sausage? Nah, I don't eat pork. Are you Jewish? I ain't Jewish, man. I just don't eat pork. Why not? They're filthy animals. I don't eat filthy animals. Sausage tastes good. Pork chops taste good. A sewer rat might taste like pumpkin pie, fool. I'll never know, because even if it did, I wouldn't eat that filthy motherfucker. Pig sleep and ruining shit. That's a filthy animal. I don't want to eat anything that ain't got enough sense to disregard its own feces. How about dogs? Dogs eat their own feces. I don't eat dogs either. Yes, but do you consider a dog to be a filthy animal? I wouldn't go as far as to call a dog filthy, but they're definitely dirty. But a dog's got personality, and personality goes a long way. So by that rationale, if a pig had a better personality, he ceased to be a filthy animal. <laughs> We'd be talking about one motherfucking charming ass pig. It would have to be the Cary Grant of fucking pigs. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, fool podcast? What's up, fool podcast? With Rodrigo Torres right here. Lisa over here, yeah, chilling with up? her new haircut. She fixed the other haircut. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? I had a bad haircut, and uh, I think my my stylist was emotional. She was telling some story. <laughs> she, was, la tra- la la <laughs> she was telling some story. This was, uh, what, a month ago? So what happened? You get your haircut, and she's crying? She's telling some story about her assistant and how her assistant, this little goth chick, she's real cool, but... I felt bad for the story because she got institutionalized. God damn. Um, like, yeah, she was suicidal and all this stuff. And then they numbed her up with drugs and she was all beside herself for seeing her that way. And But she's telling me this as she's giving me the worst haircut I've had and, Lisa, and the worst Lisa color job the, I had. And then Lisa showed to the house that she got shock therapy, bro. <laughs> <laughs> that sucks. Fuck the haircut sucks. Yeah. Uh, so I had to live with her for like a month. I had to go to San Francisco like that. Everything. I felt like shit. So. I finally found this woman that was recommended so she was to me in that Pasadena. The girl was and she fixed it. Yeah, this girl, and I felt bad, but I felt she, like she maybe you should have canceled she used this to work appointment. There? She, yeah, she was her assistant. She used to sweep hair. She washed my hair. She would sweep the hair. She would give her color, like she would prep the color and stuff like that. But I don't know what happened. But I can't go back to that woman. I just can't. It, w- it felt so. I felt like shit for weeks. Peace. I didn't want to wake up and have to do my hair again because I didn't know what to do. It was bad. <laughs> I don't want to talk about my flair. Yeah, yeah, Lisa my showed up, though. bro, like she was part of the Nazi get w- women instead of <laughs> Gestapo. Yeah, man, it's more traumatic for women <laughs> to get their hair messed up than dudes. I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't think it could be fixed. A dude, you can shave your head. A chick, you can't, dog. No. You can, bro. You could. People start asking questions. <laughs> but they do start <laughs> asking questions. Like, what happened, Pelona? <laughs> <laughs> I'm an alt writer now. <laughs> but now it's on point. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I like it. You're back. Thank You're you. happy. You yeah. look younger, too. <laughs> I think so. You're not the Sarge no more. <laughs> what does the Sarge mean? I don't know. <laughs> Sergeant Harris. Oh, my God. You ever remember that book, man? Which Speaking one of Sergeant one? Harris. It was his, I don't know what the name of the book was. It was called Sergeant Harris, F- Fire the Cannon. Never heard of that. <laughs> nah, what never had it, it in my library. <laughs> <You know? laughs> what was it about? It was like a like Hardy a, Boys. It baby. was like a like a <laughs> like a rhyming book with pictures, but then it will close with something something fire the cannon. No, I never <laughs> nah, heard of that. No? Never had that for riff. <laughs> All right, how about Danny and a dinosaur? <laughs> I had that. Time. All right, my the monster in me. Nobody. Yeah, no, I, I seen that one. All right, upcoming shows, people. Upcoming shows tonight, March second. Tonight, we're in Hilo. Hawaii at the Palace Theater. So hurry up, man. Coming down. There's still plenty of seats available. And I mean plenty. That's right, bro. <laughs> Saturday, March 3rd, Honolulu, Hawaii at Blaisdell Center with Paul Rodriguez. Hey. We're going to be in Honolulu, Blaisdell Center with Paul Rodriguez. Man, I was, I, was to, I, was to, um, I was trying to get ready for this trip, bro, like losing weight and shit. <laughs> Because I don't want to walk over there. People think I live there. <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want people to walk up to me and go, Felipe, how, how many years have you been living here, bro? How far, how far am I? <laughs> Where's the dog? The so you going to walk without a t-shirt, bro, or what? Fuck that. You're going to show those, your nipples or what? I am. I don't care, dog. <laughs> the whole time? But or just walk, when you get in the all, water? You always show but your I'm gonna body, walk with my, But I'm going to walk with socks in the water. <laughs> the fuck? I just Dude, threw I a, feet. Yeah, I have a turtle aqua snip on those you toes, those dog. Aqua shoes. No, man. I'm so confident after I fucking fix my own ingrown toenail shit. <laughs> I could walk on fire. I thought you were going to get some Crocs. Hell no. 
Crocs. Well, you know what? I am looking for Crocs. But I think I Crocs are cool. But dude. I don't want Crocs. Like you don't want the kind that I don't want people first came oh, out with. But Mario yeah. Batali Crocs, the orange yeah. ones. Yeah, I hate those. <laughs> I don't want people they to be looking at me going, ones. "Oh, look at that fucking fat ass chef." <laughs> <laughs> or fat ass fucking kitchen help, <laughs> yeah. but I do like the the Adido ones that are Crocs. That's I have some that look like slip-on Vans, and they're yeah. Crocs. They're waterproof and they float and they're like yeah. yeah. So I'm thinking again something like that. Yeah. But man, you guys should have seen my well at least I know because she she lives with me. She's my wife. <laughs> but uh, dude, my toe, the left one, I don't know how it got like that. Maybe with those 30,000 steps I did on shrooms in San Francisco. No. But God damn, It was because you cut bro. your nail too it short. It was. Like, I'm going to get you, sucker. It was, I'm going to get yeah, you, sucker. It was dude. throbbing. But I didn't fat know how bad it was. So I bumped into something. Oh, my God. Those are the worst, <laughs> dude. I bumped into something, somebody, bro. It felt like somebody hit me with a hammer, bro. It felt like somebody stomped me. It, it was. You get nauseous. It hurt so much, huh? What? You gotta talk right into the mic. You're ca- talking way up here. I can't hear you. <laughs> Don't start. <laughs> I can't. I'm telling you. I'm trying to give you a hint. And you're not taking it. <laughs> I'm mad. Back to the toenail. Toenail. <laughs> it hurt. You can't handle the toe. <laughs> <laughs> it was throbbing. <laughs> Don't <laughs> act <laughs> like that. <laughs> anyway, Stop so, it. Let me find something else. Because uh, Lisa and I were talking. Kill you I don't know sleep. what I said. But <laughs> we're talking about. Then I don't know why I changed the story to Martin's feet. Well, remember <laughs> he had that big ass black toe that one time. Yeah, but it wasn't an ingrown though. It no, was it was just big. Big though. It was huge, right? Mm. Then what? Was like a ca- camel nail or something. He was all. Oh, ha- he was all happy, right? <laughs> he had met this chick. I don't know if it was on the road or somewhere. He had met her, and Martin shows up to the to the I guess the comedy condo or the hotel room. And he told me and Ivan, hey, man, this girl is different, eh? She's fu- she's different, eh? This girl is different. Then I'm a, I think Ivan or me said, what happened, bro? You show your feet or what? <laughs> she called me Tony. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> he, he th- and then we started laughing and we didn't mention it again. <laughs> I think that Mondo first seen that shit, right? And he started. You were huge, bro. I you the big ass toy. He passed out, bro. It, it felt like, bro, like somebody shoved the. A toe on your thumb. <laughs> no, somebody shoved a potato on your thumb. <laughs> it was bad. <laughs> it was big. <laughs> hey, man, you should have that guy. Hey, bro, if you're listening, who, who? I know you're listening, man. He drew you, I, he, that fool drew you rollerblading, bro. <laughs> yeah, but he gave me the 2018 body, dog. I was I used to rollerblade when I was 10, dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. You were young when rollerblades came out. I was like 25. Yeah, Oh, they twenty four. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't not. even have them. Eh? <laughs> um, the you, first you time told I saw all these dates. No. Oh, because you got to get back to those. First time about Hawaii, and then we got lost. Oh yeah, Toe Hilo. Nails, huh? so you're gonna show your toes and all. you're Hilo. gonna wear socks. Then I got <laughs> March 9th to eleven, Phoenix at Stand Up Live. March fifteenth to seventeen, Cleveland at Hilarities. March twenty third and twenty fourth, Los Angeles at the Novo Downtown LA. March thirty, Austin, Texas. At Paramount Theater, March 31st, Atlanta, Georgia, at Variety Playhouse. Lots more dates. Check out FelipeWorld.com slash tour for all dates and ticket links. Shout outs to C Stark 52, who liked the Cap G bonus episode and says we should have an on a local rapper, Ashton Myers. We'll look no. we'll look at Matthews. <laughs> we'll, we'll look into it, bro. <laughs> Look at 8 Mile over we'll here, We'll look dog. into it over here. I guess C Star 52 is an aspiring manager. <laughs> <laughs> I, like the way, I like the way people throw in a, well, I wanted to a see... big thank you after. Yeah. A big thank you. Yo, man, but y'all, y'all need graphics. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get in there somewhere, right? Got to well, get your foot in the door? Oh, one. go for but it. But he wrote a poem, so I, oh my was, God, so I put it in there. Smoke the on the... Ast- it's Aston... Aston with a with dollar sign. Yeah. Aston <laughs> Can't be dollar. Doing the dollar Nobody's gonna find that. Aston Myers. <laughs> Aston Ma- Matthews. <laughs> the brother. Smoke on the WTR and El Arroyano, Pato de Marrano. And and Jack the Magician Electrician who gave us a little Dr. Sue Star review. I am a union elect- electrician and I listen to your podcast often. I listen to it at work and at home. 
when I'm on a plane. I listen to it in the house. I listen to it while sitting with a mouse. I listen to it when I'm here. <laughs> I listen to it when I'm there. Thank you for listening, Jack. The, the poem had a short circuit. <laughs> What happened? That was the. Wonder if this guy for plagiarism. <laughs> Why you he seen that somewhere? <laughs> That's cool, bro. Thank you for listening, man. The Jack, the magician, electrician. I guess he makes lights go off. You know what I'm saying? Hell yeah! All right. So, bro, what's up, fool? What's up, fool? So what's check this brother? out, man. Check this out. I didn't want to go to a doctor, of course, right? Because you know me. For what, the end control now? Hell no. Because I thought, I don't have the time, bro. And then somebody told me that. I don't know who told me. Did your own surgery at the house? My publicist told me. <laughs> Damn. She knows about She knows everything. everything. <laughs> yeah, bro. She knows. <laughs> Fucking Luis, Luis Guzman probably had one. <laughs> Yo, mama, how am I get rid of this? Come over here to the room. I was over here dancing the tango. Bring your machete. So, um. So I looked it up, bro. So they said, so I soak my feet in warm water for like three times a day. Okay. Because you got to soften that nail because it's hard as hell. Anybody who listening, man, who's been, been limping for two years, it's going out for you too. Anybody with a bloody so, sock. I was wondering, you know, how am I going to get under that to pull it back out? Yeah. So this, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the Google said, get floss. And I don't mean still, man, because it'll burn it. So you get, I got floss once my nail was soft. And I pull that thing back with the with the floss. <laughs> Kept yeah. practicing every day, bro, with the floss, and I finally got it out. And now, bro, I'm walking like a ballerina. <laughs> These like right now, I could kick a wall, bro. <laughs> <laughs> These literally are bunion stories. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody else has a bunion or something, or what? <laughs> It's a, it's it's that a glass sign, slipper it's over here. Sign code. It's a Seinfeld uh, reference, but it's, it's the Seinfeld. It's funny though. It's a Seinfeld <laughs> reference. Because um, one time, uh, I guess that Kramer didn't have enough stories to tell because Kramer finds he, a. He sold all his stories to Mr. Petersman. No, 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 no. This is when Kramer finds a. Um, oh, oh, that's right. Never mind. Sorry. That was. I'm talking about the sh when he finds the what Mike did you, Douglas. What did you uh, just quit? <laughs> I'm talking I about. I mean, seriously, quit. <laughs> I mean, when he's he found the uh, set for Mike du the Mike Douglas show. I mean, Merv Griffin, Griffin show, right. and then he sets it up in his apartment, and then he's bored, and because uh, they're they're they run out of stuff to talk to, run out of guests, and then he says to um, he says to Newman, uh, he Newman starts talking, and he's like, "Oh, they just had Bunyan stories, yeah, something like that, right?" Anyway. Long story short. Shout out to Pop Bunyan. Cut all that out. He said out. He, had bust, he had bought some. <laughs> yeah. But that one too, he had bought some Bunyan stories. He bought some Bunyan stories last night. Two different episodes, I forgot. Anyway, whatever. Whatever. <laughs> but you corrected what? it though, if you fixed it. I can't believe it. Yeah, man. I, so if anybody listening out there, man, <laughs> I am the ingrown toenail <laughs> doctor now. And man... If anybody with bad feet, man, I know a lot of people don't have health insurance, man. I'm just telling you, man, <laughs> soak your feet in water, okay, every day, hot, warm water, and with uh, vinegar maybe also, three times a day, and practice pulling your feet back, your toe back every day. Your toenail. Your toenail. And get a floss and dig in there, man. That's every day, work, every though. day, every day, every day. All your feet, every day, every day. <laughs> then little, feet. little by little, man, you start seeing that nail start going back straight. And that's a bunion story for Felipe Esparza. <laughs> and the podiatrist. Over What's here. up, fool, man? We're gonna read a couple of quotes right here before we introduce our guest. I, Cause I, I got prepared this time, man. I, I didn't just, <laughs> this time. <laughs> I didn't just um, get the names wrong and start putting people that were born in Long Beach when they were really born there. <laughs> Nobody told you that. Either. I have no desire to be a politician. I don't want to lead anyone. I have no practical ego. I am not ambitious. I merely want to do what is right. Once in every century there comes a man who is chosen to speak for his people. Moses, Mao, and Martin are examples who to say that I am not such a man. In this day and age, 
The man for all season needs many voices. Perhaps that is why the gods have sent me into Riverbank, Panama, San Francisco, Alpine, and Juarez. Perhaps that is why I've been taught so many trades. Who would deny that I am unique for months, for years? Not all my life, I sought to find out who I am. Why do you think I became Baptist? Why did I try to force myself into the riverbank swimming pool? And did I become a and did I become a lawyer just to prove to the publishers I could do something worthwhile? Any idiot that sees only the obvious is blind. For God's sake, I have never seen and I have never felt inferior to men to any man or beast. The man was never comfortable unless he was in the company of people who were crazier than he was. And when he roared into your driveway at night, you knew he was bringing music, whether you wanted it or not. Any combination of a 250-pound Mexican and LSD-25 is a potentially <laughs> terminal menace for anything that can reach. And that is Oscar Zeta Acosta, Autobiography of a Brown Buffalo. And for those of you who are listening to me right now, just you guys letting you know that um, um, I'm our guest right here, you know, I'm not gonna make stuff up, man. But I, I did have, I do have um, a book that I, that um, that um, that Oscar Zeta Acosta wrote, and it's in, it's in my book right here. I'm just gonna find it to make sure I ain't no poser. <laughs> I got it right here somewhere, and it's right here. Yeah, what's <laughs> up, fool? Right here, man. I read 50 percent of it. It says right here, and it's um. I don't, I don't want to show up, but it is bad here. But it's um, the revolt of the cockroach people. Yes, I have it in my book. What's up, fool? We have Philip <laughs> Rodriguez, right? Yeah. Right here. Yes, How and doing, he has he wrote no. and directed an uh, awesome documentary about a person. You guys don't bother even to look up or never bother to mention. This guy's not even in um in the history books. Like you gotta like you you gotta find like the, to find out about Oscar Zeta Costa sometime, man. You gotta find it by watching Fear and Loathing. Then you then you you gotta look. Cause you, you really like the movie. You gotta look. Okay, man. This guy that, that's playing Benicio is he a real dude or something? Then you find out he's a real motherfucker. How did you find out about him, Rodrigo? You you went you you're a college grad. Yeah, I I found about him through that movie and I heard about him and. Uh, this uh, course called History of American uh, Racism taught by Elliot Barkan, the Chicanismo and all that stuff. And then we went to that um, uh, exhibit at the, at the... La Raza exhibit. La, La Raza exhibit. Jean uh, Autry Museum. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is still going on, by the way, till next February 2019. Are you serious? Yeah. I thought it was going to be this I February. I it was too, we, but That's no, what I told next, people. Oh, next awesome. February. It's still going on, Autry Museum. Uh, and um, tell them you heard about it on the What's Up Full podcast. Yeah. If you go by, give them a little donation when you go in. Only exhibit you got to see there. I mean, it's really cool. It's all oh, the photos, bitching, all man. the photos from the exhibit. Uh, I mean, from the beginning of the magazine La Raza. through the end of it. So, so eleven today, years, I think. We have uh, Philip Rodriguez. He uh, wrote the Rise and Fall of the Brown Buffalo, a documentary about Oscar Zeta Costa, Chicano civil rights activist, author, attorney, also produced by Benicio del Toro. Philip is an award-winning documentary filmmaker who has made films for PBS for years. Father of an attorney in Los Angeles. But let's get to know him, bro. We gotta read all this stuff, man. Yeah, man. What's up, fool? <laughs> What's up? <laughs> Whenever I walk into a room and there's people who know who Oscar is, I immediately feel I'm with friends, more comfortable. And, you know, the guy deserved more recognition than he got. And he was fantastic like so many Chicanos, this was a big man. This was a big man with a big soul and a big ego and a big project and a big ambition and big madness and a big panza. <laughs> and the motherfucker was just totally marginalized. He's invisible. And, and it's ridiculous that a guy like this is, is a footnote and we're just trying to correct it. Do you think it was because he's too wild? I think it was because he was too brown. I think it was because too smart. he was too smart, he was too threatening, he was, and for the polite little 
Chicanos. For real, man. And For the university ones, he was a little too rough and right, right. wild and edges. cochino and... He was very That's, candid. He was you know? like the opposite of Martin Luther King, and kind of not as not as strict like Malcolm X. Malcolm X didn't do drugs. Yeah, I mean, he was they just think he, seriously, huh? He was had a lot of edge and a lot of wildness, and he was horny, and he, you know, <laughs> ate, ate a lot of burritos. Well, but when you think about the way they wrote the civil rights history, it's always these saintly people right. trying to do the right thing, we're, and a lot of people. They were just trying to get laid. You know, Oscar said, you know, the revolution doesn't have to be a drag. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's the kind of symbol that the kids at this point need. You know, because you know, they think about the civil rights people and it's all these sainted people, you know, God bless Dolores or Caesar or whatever, but Oscar never won a hunger stripe, not even for 20 <laughs> minutes. You know? So, yeah, so I'm, I'm excited to be here, and I watched your HBO show the other day, or maybe it was Showtime, but, but it was so funny, and it Thank was you. so right, and I recognized my own people when I saw you, and I saw Oscar and you, and the intelligence, the exuberance, the anger, the, the wild way of speaking, I really, that's, that's, you're, you're my people, and you're also my tokayo, so by the way, so. <laughs> Hell yeah. I, I, saw, I saw the documentary, I saw it this morning. Oh, okay. Well, we were supposed to watch it last night, last but night. we got so tired and I was doing work. So yeah, we were Freud's. playing a trip. But um, <laughs> I want to, like, uh, when we went to the doc, we went to go see the the exhibit, um, there was li- there was a little bit of Oscar. Yeah, not, not a lot. He wasn't even prominent. In but the... um, there was another guy there that you probably know him, maybe, because you seem to know a lot, of, a lot of stuff about the Chicano movement more than I know. But remember that guy that used to book at that season? What was his yeah. name? Raul. Ruiz. Raul Ruiz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He yes. was all I threw I didn't even know that. I, I didn't even know he was uh, involved in the Chicano movement. But um, he was, his face was all over all over the photos. And the reason I know him because I used to put up a comedy show for him and all that money used to go for scholarships. Ruiz uh, was uh, one of the co-founders of La Raza Magazine. La Raza and, Magazine. And, and a yes. very uh, kind of heroic photographer who put his neck out there and <laughs> took a lot of pictures that Without Ruiz and a lot of his cohort, we wouldn't have any record of that era. It would all be that man- crazy? lies and stories and mentiras. And as it is, you know, <coughs> because the because the history is so invisible, because histories of people, of women and non-whites, really matters a lot less than the history of the people that the people that control things write the histories. They end oh, totally. up. They have the means of dissemination, of production, of making films, of green lighting projects, TV shows publishing books, and their stories, the ones that get prized, that be considered the ones that are important traditionally. And obviously, the implications of this are pretty, pretty, pretty profound and pretty terrible, because if you don't see yourself as important, you're going to really ingest the idea that you are indeed secondary, that you don't have any agency, that it's hopeless for you to even try to act, because you don't fucking matter, because you are a fucking nigger. And I mean that in a pejorative, old-school way, that... So it's you yeah, gotta insist on as you guys do sit around here and talk and and, 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 and and on your own spin and your own narrative. And so I'm just trying to introduce people that really have value, I think. Not just as a past artifact, but something that we can use in the present moment. Some when these this fool's coming in on the DACA kids, you know, you gotta have somebody who's chingon enough, who's got enough fucking balls, madness, love to step the fuck up and get into the face of these pricks that are coming at you. So that, that kind of inspires the, the, the conversation that, that I want to... So that how, how, that's how, how hard, hardcore Oscar was in those times. Oscar was armed. Oscar had a... I feel about a, I remember a fucking documentary that fool took... That fool, uh, he raised a, a gun in the air, bro. In the, in the courtroom. Court. In the courtroom. Yeah. You know, in the courtroom, he'd come in on mescaline. He'd have drugs, and he had this attache case that was with decals and flower power all over it. And he'd come in descalzo to the court. He'd come on barefoot sometimes to show absolute disrespect. And one day, he walked into the courtroom with a guayabera, right? And the judge says, Mr. Acosta, post the bench. This is not acceptable clothing for a courtroom. Oscar says, excuse me, sir. That's a real gringo attitude. In my country, a guayabera is a formal wear. And I'm going to insist upon my right to do that. Well, Oscar ended up going to jail for contempt. But for wearing a white, I bet. For wearing a white, I bet. Right? So 
I like the guy because he's rebellious, but like you said before, he's not serious like, like Malcolm. And not to say Malcolm's not valuable, because he is. But Oscar is ours. He's the everyday man. In some ways, you know, he was, he was, he was, and he was also had this really quality of being transparent about himself. Right? He, 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 was, he, was, he was uncomfortable with his big mestizo cylindrical body. And he... Or you go too, he wears three jackets. <laughs> this, he's so cylindrical, but... You like it? That's a good description. Yeah. <laughs> and so he was just kind of... He was raw. You know, he, wasn't, he, wasn't, he wasn't a saint. He was a regular person. And with a lot of flaws and a lot of defects. And he was probably bipolar and crazy as fuck. My favorite part <laughs> is when he, he goes into the bar. And, let's see. He goes oh, into yeah, the he bar and he says... He goes into the bar Aspen, bro, by himself. <laughs> The only, the only Mexican fool walks in and he goes... What, I met Hunter? He goes, hey. Yeah. He said, uh, what did he say? He said, uh, hey. This, I'm, I'm, I'm the, the trouble, trouble you've been, you been looking I'm for. The I'm the trouble you've been looking for. <laughs> like, that's his introduction yeah. to the bar. But see, and I can see him doing that. I can see Felipe. Felipe has done that. Yeah, did you, did you, re did you relate to that identity of Hell Oscar? Yeah. Talk, talk to me about that. I relate it, man, because... Um, Everybody in the world has said you should. I was born for that, bro. Been in that role. <laughs> so, uh, when I was in Boston, some guy told me that he had some. Some guy told me that to get that book, the um, the revolt of the cockroach people, because he said, "Man, if there, is there ever a movie, man, or a play you could play that guy?" And he goes, "All right." But then I found out that he was the guy that was the name called the uh, the Wild Samoan. Samoan. I think he's. But I remember, man, because um. I remember in my stand-up comedy, like, like, I, like people don't like it. Like when I, like when I wrote that, like right now, some of that material, a lot of people get sad. You know, they get too, they get too hurt. Like when I mentioned that so um, social justice warrior, social justice warrior. When I mentioned like that, um, that I like that, um, when that that we have racism in our own culture too, man. Like when I say that, um, whenever we see a darker Mexican, we look at him. Remember who invited that? Who invited, who, who invited Chocomil? Chocomil. Right? And I said, like, as, as, to be funny. That's funny. I said, to be funny because it's true. All right? But some people use it as, now I'm racist. He's promoting, he's promoting, promoting colorism. I'm promoting colorism now. <laughs> and instead then, of opening the door to discussing that yeah, as that, a truth, yeah, let's, let's through find, humor instead of a lecture. Let's find out why then. <laughs> let's find out why Telemundo yeah. never has a Prieto right. or a dark African, a dark, there is dark, there is black Mexicans, why, why, why isn't there a black Mexican announcing sports? Why isn't there a black Colombian? Those are shot in yeah. Colombia, too. Yeah, in Colombia. Why isn't there person that? On TV and then we won't, we won't question that. Yeah. They're going to question about how they get me off the air. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like that's how this dude was, man. That's how Oscar was because he didn't like everybody wanted, like, everybody wanted, like, um, to surround himself with only smart intellectuals instead of being around the real people who, who actually need the help. That fool, fool, that fool got all the cholos together, bro. And, all the, and then all those, um, I, always call, I always call these guys the three one thousands because, um, because you know. Like Terminator. They're, like, they're Terminator. They're Mexican-American, but they're the new versions, you know. They come with degrees, you know. They don't like blood, that movie Blood and Blood Out. <laughs> they think American me shouldn't be part of our culture. Well, there is a, a movement afoot. Well, I don't know how big a movement, but uh, within the Latino social justice warriors that you see and, and this is not every Chicano activist or Latino activist at all but there's a small percentage that just take everything too far and it closes doors it gets people to stop it people tune you out it, it makes them all look like crazy that. oh they're not together yeah and there is a movement also by those same people to split Chicano into old school Chicano and new school Chicano and like these old school Chicanos are these people who think like that if people like it's almost like looking down on people who might have been who might be a veterano now you know what you know or they were oh, in they, a gang they can't in the take past, him because they he used to dropped do out coke. of high school or yeah they sold drugs at one point you know like because that doesn't promote positive chicano values but this is part of the fabric of the whole our world we're our in a stage of yeah. becoming got to figure that yeah. most latinos that are here come after like <laughs> after the 1965 immigration act right so the most latinos in this country by the great m proportion of them come in the 80s we came in the uh, 80s no right we came 
Actually, my my green card says eighty one. There you go. So yeah, I mean, I came over here when before when Ronald Reagan before Ronald Reagan. Ronald said it. Ronald Reagan before Ronald Reagan did the crazy law. The amnesty. I was already fixed. Nineteen eighty six. We got ready for him. So. You know, we're just new. We're just settling yeah. into this place. And to think that we're going to be completely polite or completely organized or completely have one mind is stupid. Is I mean, we're just brand new people. Think about the Jews. They're 5,000 years talking to each other, wandering around the desert, learning how to read, practicing their prayers. We are just started. So obviously it's going to be messy. Obviously it's going to be ridiculous sometimes. Obviously it's going to be conflictual. It should be. And, and we have to stop being so fucking polite and so doctrinaire and just mix it up a little bit and have and this is why what you all do here is great because it's conversation that's loose and informal and intelligent and free and we have to speak freely and that's one of the reasons the comedians I think are so valuable now because you guys can tr cross those lines that others can't and do it in a way that's appealing to people and Oscar had that kind of quality right just bring it bring reality What's, what's your background? Where'd you come from? I'm from L.A. My oh, grandparents, uh, well, I was raised, I was born in the South, uh, San Gabriel. And then my, oh, and then I Sandra. got over to, we, I, well, they moved me to Glendale when I was a boy. And in Glendale at that time, it was the headquarters of the American Nazi Party from 1965 wow. really? to 1982. So when I was a boy, wow. I mean, seriously. Second grade, I remember, Nazi go, party, I remember like Ma American Nazi party. Oh, oh. Yeah, I mean, a bunch of fucking yeah, knuckleheads. And they used to march around yeah. and give out pamphlets and say, no niggers, fix them. And it was a sundown town into the 50s, which meant that if you drove through, if you were non white, and you were there after dark, where at? In Glendale. They would roll up, the cop would roll up on a bike and say, Sonny, get the fuck out. Yeah. So you couldn't be there after dark. My father and mother. We were a very dark-skinned family, we still are, and, 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 and they, they put us there in a good neighborhood. So it was very interesting. And I remember going in second grade, I had to piss, went to the little urinal, little boy's urinal, and a couple boys got around the side of me and looked at my pee-pee, and of course they were, after they got over the shock of this enormity, <laughs> they, they said, whoa, that's brown too. <laughs> so, you know, it was, really was the other. And you learn about white people, in a really great way when you're in, when you're in an environment like that. I don't know where I start. You asked me where I was from, so that's where I'm from. My parents were all gra my grandparents were Mexicans. When the Armenians show up, the Armenians way don't after. show up until way later. Again, so it's super white bread from They're 65 gone now. to white 82. People are gone now. White people have yeah. bol are bolting. Even my mom, she still <laughs> lives there, and she she says, "Mijo, you know these Armenians. I'm not so sure about them." She says, "Sometimes I miss the racist gringos." Oh my gosh. Instead of the racist Armenians? <laughs> you know, they're finding their way too, right? They're pushing right. and shoving and they're insecure and they don't know where they're at. And they got their little, A little more movie insular. that's going on. And they're, yeah. they're like any group. Yeah. Think about the Koreans before the, mm -hmm. the riots. I, I used to go to Koreatown. I'd get thrown out of bars because they didn't want anybody but their own. They were paranoid. They were afraid. And, of course, they got into that bronca with the blacks, right, because they didn't understand African-American behavior, and the whole thing blows up. But now you go to Koreatown, and they're chill. They're comfortable. And so, you know, everybody's got to find their way here, and you've got to elbow each other out to, 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 and, and understand who your neighbor is and know how to, how to get along with each other and how to thrive. And I think L.A. is great right now, don't you think? Do you like, I mean, the, the, mm -hmm. the whole polyglot immigrant mixture? I've always loved Ale. Yeah, Ale's great. I've always liked Ale. Yeah. Rodrigo, you're very quiet over there, brother. Oh, yeah, I'm just it's taking Silent it all Bob. in. Oh, okay. He's also known as Silent Bob. I'm just taking it all in. <laughs> He's from Riverside, man. You know, that's the fault. Yeah, where the men are made. Where, uh, <laughs> where did, uh, where did, uh, when did you first get acclimated to, uh, Oscar? Yeah. You know, Oscar's one of those things. My mom was friends with Oscar's sister. I went to, uh, college and I read his book and I, you know it, 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 it was fascinating to me and so I really wanted to make a picture oh, a long so time ago you said your father's an attorney my father was an attorney also yeah yeah my father was an attorney and a Mexican-American attorney in that era right right and I remember him telling me one day about a big fat Mexican who showed up to court with bare feet and you know so he was a witness to all those sort of, oh, yeah, okay. and, he, and, he, and he didn't approve of him necessarily he thought he was a little bit you know nasty but right. amusing yeah, because so, I know he's wild, but I still treat him as an intellectual because he had a lot of great ideas. Oh, listen, that's what I'm saying. Um, the guy was marvelous. He was fucking strong. He was he was a, he was a very good in the courtroom, but he was also, 
you know, he was wild. And you can be both things. That's the right, point. Right, right. And that's, there's so many different things to be special when you're Mexican. I know there's a lot of Mexican people said, oh, I always had white teachers. There was always like white cops. In my, my, my first, uh, in elementary school, my principal was Mexican. Uh, our district attorney was Mexican. Wow. So it was different for me. I, I always seen those, because to me, it wasn't like a chip on my shoulder coming out to the world. Now I got to fucking do something with these white people. And you also see different types of white people, not just that one white person that's, you know, racist or whatnot. So. Sure. I mean, I got white people in my family, and I love totally. them, and they're my people. And there's, there's no th- the contradiction, because obviously, as we elevate, and we become more, as you suggest, part more of the leadership of things, then we become, it's, it's, it's less conflictual until a moment right, again right, like right. this, totally. where whites now feel like they're under Especially attack. Especially right now. Well, again, Since, it, it, it uh, rotated you know, back. Oh, totally. Yeah, they, it wrote, they rotated back because basically one guy, Lyndon Johnson once said, this is, a, this is like a political strategy. He once said, if you can convince the lowest white man that he's higher than the highest black man, you can pick his pockets forever. And that's exactly what they're doing. Oh, that's what happened now. Because when these white people saw Yo. Obama elegantly, the Harvard Law, Law Review and shit, walking up the stairs of Air Force One, and they're fucking struggling to pay for their Pop-Tarts or whatever the fuck they're doing, they, fl- they flipped their shit. You know, it basically assaulted their fundamental sense of whatever less dignity they got. My so dream. when they witness this, that it just uh, it undermined the le- the my, rest of their stability. My American dreams in shambles. Precisely. I mean, they got less money. They got less health care. They got less everything. They got less prestige. Houses are harder to buy. Their kids are on oxy fucking cotton. And they're then, not living the lives of their parents' generation. Precisely. Like they're always comparing yeah, that, themselves that's, to that's that. Yeah, that's something that's and weird. And then they, they see a right. fucking the Negro factory. in the Air Force One, and you know that t- they come undone. And one thing cool is about Ain't no Oscar. More raccoon to hunt. That he was an <laughs> activist. He was actually speaking up when their kids were getting the my shit kicked out about the cops. Sleep with me no and more. that's what a lot of people weren't doing that because you know we're more of a passive culture. You know what I mean? But he like kind of like brought forth this you know roof on my dog. You know what I mean? Kind of like you know the Pack Panthers. But their, that's a uh, great point up. that you make. That the passivity of our people, that we're kind of almost pathologically inclined toward conciliation, and afraid of conflict. Right. And that's a problem. We just right? want to work. It's too. It's a problem. Because you got to, listen, I mean, you got to get in people's faces. <laughs> 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 you don't get a problem. Precisely. Do you think that comes from being part of families who did come here as immigrants and they don't want to rock the boat? I think it comes of? from um, Catholicism, I think. It Catholicism comes from too, maybe. the effects of colonialism. Yeah. When all of a sudden you're swarmed by new people with a new set of order and you're dislocated. Think about the man, the indigenous people of, um, of Mesoamerica, mm-hmm. the mestizos. You don't know what your Even place Asian in the social people. order is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You got a Fuck rough yeah, authoritarianism. Yeah. You know, it's kind of dominating you people above and, and making you feel you, ashamed. Yeah. The black right? hats. Yeah. You know, wiping you out with, sh- with self shame, race shame, body yeah. shame. And um, Asians too, man. They're afraid. They never call the cops. They don't. Go to Chinatown. They get yelled at. Oh pushed. hell yeah! Like I seen, I seen Chinese people get pushed by their bosses when well, I was there. Like yell that in their face if they just put their head down, go to work. Yeah, and that's a class they thing never too. Fly, they never mm-hmm. fight back. Because in Mexico, it's they're different. there all day, bro. All day. Like I, I've been to a Chinese restaurant when I got there, and the same guy is there cooking oh, yeah. all day. Twelve like, hour oh, shifts yeah, and shit. And nobody, and nobody gonna step in and go, hey, um, you know you can't. You're not supposed to be here eight hours, right? Yeah. No, 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 no. Hell no. He's nice to me. Because <laughs> right here, you have class, uh, like a class system. You know, it's not as hardcore as it in Mexico. But in Mexico, if you ain't got no money, you can't hang out with people that have money. Here it's different. You know, a rich everybody knows a rich guy. I mean, no, for real, in Mexico, you can't? You can say whatever it is, you got family. That, you know, my family has a rich. But motherfuckers, they got real money. I'm talking about that real ass money. You know what I mean? You can't hang out with them. It's just not going to happen. They're going to yeah. bring poor people. Like, there's no way Chef will be in the same room with <laughs> Russell Peters. <laughs> no, I thought. In Mexico. <clears throat> and that's blatant out there, dude. You know what I mean? And just look at, look at everybody on TV. Look at even their political leadership. They're all mostly white. You know, of, you know, Absolutely. So, you know, we haven't had our crack at it yet. Since, since the time before the, you know, Columbus and Cortez <laughs> arrived, the Mestizo, we've been on kind of on the bottom of the totem pole, and we continue to be. But you have to, what I love is you can be like, a, like you step on the stage, and you're not making apologies for anybody. You're just a rude, free bilking. You don't, you're not malevolent, but you're going to do your thing the way you're going to do it. And that kind of posture is what Oscar had, is what I think that I, we, we should encourage. I don't want to still be rude, but you can be rude too. 
You know, the gre- the, you the, can step on toes. The squeaky wheel. Step on the right ones. Gets, gets, the oil. gets the fucking grease. And uh, so that's another thing I like about this guy, Oscar. Is it? He doesn't give one fuck. You know, and he's not going to back down. And he's absolutely fundamentally because he's by bi- bi- bipolar crazy motherfucker. He doesn't fucking care. Yeah, very unorthodox. <laughs> and uh, was there any relationship with him and Cesar Chavez and all that other stuff? Yeah, or? I think that you know, vaguely. I mean, vaguely. The thing is, yeah, yeah, sure. This guy's had some kind of. N- knowledge of one another, but <laughs> Caesar is rural, right? It's farm workers, which yeah. my grandparents were. They picked fruit up and down the coast, and um, they were always agriculturists. But Oscar was an urban animal, like all of us now. Latinos, the, the whole mythology that we're like Cesar Chavez, and, <laughs> you know, picking up shit, you know, <laughs> that's no longer the case. We're, know, we're suburban people. Yeah, man. And, and Oscar was like us. He ate the fucking sandwiches out of the goddamn refrigerator. You know, and he didn't pick nothing. He picked when he was a kid, but you know, he was urban. He, he was punch. college educated. I see that guy drinking punch out of the gallon, bro. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, bro. They'll break. He he With was a sandwich at least that. He, he liked Weras. <laughs> he liked Negras. You know, me he, too. He was he was all good for him. He wasn't he wasn't he wasn't perfect, man. He was a he was an he was a you know an animal, like um I like that um. When when you in the, in the documentary, you you you, st- you touched on parts that a lot of people in na- will never admit. Like when he said that um, he never spoke Spanish. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of people who who who, who don't speak Spanish right now, who front that they don't have to speak Spanish. Oh, yeah. Okay, we're gonna mention Ted Cruz and Mark Rubio, but anyways, <laughs> but you know they front like R- Rubio speaks Spanish. Yeah, but Cruz doesn't. But anyway, they asked him about. <laughs> they asked him one time about food, and he didn't know. Right. Yeah. And the thing about Mexicans, Mexicans don't care. Other Mexicans don't, don't care. care. People don't speak Spanish. They just care. Are you down? Yeah. yeah. That's it. That's what we care about. We don't care if you're third generation, fourth generation. We don't care if you yeah. grew up in Montebello or you grew up in um, Pico Union. If you're down, you're down. That's if you it, can't man. speak Spanish, that's cool. Okay. I just remember, be down. I was with my brother, and we were in Guadalajara. Happened to meet there. Guadalajara, and, and, Guadalajara. And, 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 and Mayor Antonio was there giving a speech in Spanish. And we were watching Antonio on TV. Villaregosa? Right? Villaregosa, yeah. And he was giving a speech, and it was bocho Spanish like mine, right? <laughs> and I was, felt so proud. <laughs> That he was just fucking it up and bungling it like I would, you know, putting go the, for broke, the, yeah, put, making the wrong words and shit. And I felt like that's my Spanish, <laughs> and I'm I'm proud of it. You know, ba- that ain't too bad from a cholo from City Terrace. Eh? Hey, how, many, how many <laughs> me entiendes? He did. Ten me entiendes. No Nintendo. Sabes qué? Sabes qué? Y después yo dije. You know what, Rasa? Yo te dije. I went to I went to Berkeley, and there was this guy who used to work in the a Chicano guy that. He, 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 he represented Perfect. himself as the most Chicano of all Chicanos, right? He was a pure Chicano. And the only fucking word he knew in how to say in Spanish was, ¿Sabes qué? And yeah. every other thing he would say was in English and then, I ¿Sabes qué? Tim guys like that. <laughs> that was, you know, right? that was yeah. harp on that little yeah. word. Huh? Some long hair, two long hair comedians. <laughs> that, uh, one named uh, Shang and the other one who looks like him. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a, uh, but I feel like with activism, any sort of activism, I, I, I don't understand why there have to be rules. You there know? is no like, rules. There aren't. Just there do shouldn't something. be rules about how you should behave. So you say, you know, people say w- would describe him as a flawed. You know, he's flawed for an activist, right? But what is flawed? You know, what are the rules for being an activist? Because I said about feminism, you know, and people, if w- there are women who come down on women who want to be a housewife, who want to be a housewife. They don't want to work. They want to raise kids. They want to get married. They want to do that. It's on you. It's on you. For me, it's always been about choices, having equal mm. choices in life. Totally. And it, it begins and ends there for me as a feminist. But there are all these other rules that people come in. You're not acting right. And, and once you right. have a fucking animal like this guy being the president, this fucking pig, this rampant <laughs> sack of bro. shit. No, the, 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 notion <laughs> that, the notion that we would, call, we would ask Who activists me, or women no. to have a higher standard yeah. than this fucking oh. animal is, is great. So tell Who me about you your... you calling an animal? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not an animal. I love, I love people. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was going to say... Um, <laughs> about that. It's getting better. Oh, it's good. It's getting better, I yeah. know. Hey, uh, Reese, that's what I like about that professor from Masisa. And he's not out there every day on his Facebook talking about what he did or what he did. Yeah, bragging. And a, a lot of act, oh. so-called activists right now in this particular oh. day and age. Selling T-shirts. Every day oh. on Twitter. I'm like, what really? are you, you many, ain't doing nothing but being a keyboard wor- warrior. How many are you going to draw? You know what I mean? <laughs> Seriously. 
Oh, I mean, like, I'm talking about activism. Like, if you're a landlord and somebody like, gets hurt in that house, people, you're going to give them free rent till he gets fixed. Some or people think Help them out. Some people think that just by posting a photo of, of a tapatio sauce <laughs> and saying that you grew up eating it, that's their activism for the day. Are you for two hours a day at your house teaching kids how to read, the neighbors how to read, get, get them an access to information? Get them, I mean, come on. That's stuff that you ain't going to get necessarily paid for. Everybody wants to get paid for for the activism and wants to get liked for it. That's what I see. No, no. Sure. They want to get gold stars. Like and they want to be a pat on the back. And, they, and, and, and when indeed, some of these old Chicano guys, man, they spent, they're the guys that ran away when the shit got hard. And now they're the ones you see every Come fucking on, yeah. weekend giving the speech, convening little talks to tell, oh, yeah. to tell you how great they were. And they were just bullshit people. So yeah, you I didn't see them in no photos. <laughs> yeah, I know. And that's a gem, dude, that they were able to f- salvage all that and document what they did. But um, that's, that's what I'm saying about um, people that actually are doing something and doing it out of the kindness of their ho- heart, how they're believing, you know, oh, I mean, you know, believe in Jesus Christ and all that, but you're not actually sharing it with your brothers, regardless of what color they are. Because there was also a Hungarian kid that got shot and ki- killed with right there by the cops. Yeah, Hungarian Jew, I think. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, that, the, that goes before he's putting his neck out. For everybody that's you know living in the neighborhood, she was too. So we can't forget dudes like that. I'm not that. sure that guy wasn't an informant. Oh really? Yeah. If he was, that's what you get. No <laughs> plan. But um, nevertheless, he was. You also, I mean, regardless did of a fact. documentary about uh, Ruben Salazar. Yeah, the that man was in the a couple. That was a couple years ago. Yeah, another figure from that era. That again. You, you think know, his death affected um, Oscar a lot? Sure, I mean, it affected a whole bunch of them because... They this, slowed down their movement? You know, it wasn't the revolutionary guys that got killed. It was this middle-class journalist, journalist that gets yeah. killed. And these other heroes, well, most of them just went into hiding. Because they if, if that can happen to this dude, what's going to happen to me? Yeah. Maybe? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, it, 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 and, it, and it also tells you how deep the conviction may or not may not have been. Oscar doubled down after that, and he went hard, and he called in Hunter Thompson, and he said, Hunter... I need you to write about this. You have access to Rolling Stone magazine. Right, give him a this is a crazy platform. thing, precisely. So Oscar went on the offensive in a big way after that. A lot of these so-called people that traipse around like they were heroes went underground or just went low-key. But Oscar amped it up. Because it seems like it kind of died after that, right? I think, I think, a, I think a lot of things died. You know, I think you know, once the white kids stopped getting drafted, they left. <laughs> they went back to the middle class hustle those baby boomers that were so active in the anti-war movement right once the draft stops they, they have no stake in women's rights anymore they have no stake in black rights anymore they're going back to being straight up white pecker woods and going for the gold a lot right? of those guys ended up in corporate positions corporate oh, leadership fuck positions yeah. the hippies rule the country at that point. i know the guy who started the tofuti company and his friend and that guy used to live on the farm in tennessee like the hippie farm the for commune real. He runs, to, well, I don't know about now, he's retired probably, but he was running Tofuti Co- Corporation wow. in New Jersey. It was weird. It was yeah. like, and he was all about, like, you know, that fast paced lifestyle. That a lot of the guys were on, were on the make, you know, and a lot of the Chicanos. <laughs> and well, I just read a book biography about Jan Wenner, the guy that founded Rolling Stone magazine. The guy just, his people made fortunes, nearly billions, hustling the, the revolution. But that's always going to be the case. Oh, hell yeah. You know, you still got to act, as, as you suggested. Try to speak truthfully and do the right thing. Where the where people can find this movie when it comes out? Where are they gonna find it? It's on PBS. Where? PBS. Oh, it's oh on yeah, PBS. it's gonna be oh, on PBS. Bad. But I don't um, even know the March, date. March twenty third. Thank you very much. On March twenty first at nine p.m. Twenty third. Yeah. And so, it's gonna. The great thing is that that the network provides. It's gonna be seen in every market. So oh, it's not yeah. just teaching Chicanos their own history, but for this free. is for free <laughs> people. <laughs> but this is for. Everybody. So some some knuckle knucklehead in, in 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 Memphis or in Green Bay, Wisconsin, or a young person, a thirteen year old white girl, you know, or city in, terror in, in, knuckleheads. In, they're, they're all going to be have access to this part of our history and to a character that's more like us than than a lot of that they know. Did you speak to anybody that um, that that was that told you how uh, pissed off Oscar was when he? Call him a three hundred Samoan instead oh. of making him Chicano. Cause I, I I always thought I always hate when they always personally I always li- never like when they do that like when they take a role that was meant for somebody but then they change it so much that okay, becomes something else. It becomes something else. Told him what it, what it really was. We saw that I saw the documents and I talked to him, Oscar's lawyer, who's a friend, just Jewish guy, Neil Herring, and he described how ra- how full of rage and felt betrayed Oscar felt, and Oscar sued, uh, threatened to sue Rolling Stone magazine. So stop the publication of Fear and Loathing. And in fact, he stopped the making of the first film about Fear and Loathing. 
successfully because he was so pissed off at Hunter. And so Rolling Stone and its affiliates came to Oscar and said, hey, we, we, got, a, we got a problem, right? He says, yeah, we got a problem. Well, what if we give you a book deal? And out of that conflict, out of that threatened lawsuit, Oscar got a book deal to, to make his two terrific Nutty. Oh, they came accounts. from that. That's yeah, they where came, his they book came, deals came from. Oh, I didn't they know came that. Out of Buffalo, right? Wow. He was basically Oscar was claiming I own fifty percent of Fear and Loathing. Yeah. And if you don't give it to me, I will not allow you to publish this. So he muscled up on these dudes, and that's where his loyal lawyer training came in handy. Hell yeah. And got himself the book. And it really, without those books, we wouldn't be talking about Oscar no. Costa. We wouldn't Crazy, we know yeah. a whole lot of that era. So he did us a favor. Unfortunately, Oscar was really a mess. You know. Why Why do they uh, mention so much? Um, Dolores Huerta, Cesar Chavez, they mentioned um, JFK, uh, Robert you, F. K. How come no, 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 nothing about him? Like, why didn't there like a, even a, a mural? Why didn't there a mural somewhere? Because or why, why are our children not taught that? Why no, no, nobody mentions him? Like, and saying, you know, listen, bro, this guy fought for your ass, dog. This lawyer was fucking battling, like, was fighting cases that nobody wanted to take. Oh yeah, man. What's your answer to that question? My answer to that is that there was a, not necessarily that they were passive, but they were creating a union. It was a farm workers union, and you attach it to the Democratic Party, and then you attach that. They're Mexicans from here that could vote, so then um, there you have that. That's why I think there's political. Um, and listen, Dolores Huerta is there. establishment. She was a, totally. in the Hillary Clinton circle, right? So she's a, an establishment Democrat, established apparatchnik of a major party. And so she's useful to them. She's useful to rich people, to rich white people that run the Democratic Party. They make most of the decisions about the, the Democratic Party, but try to do it on the backs of non-whites and non-white votes. So, and they they were against illegal immigration. Well, they as called well. them they called them <laughs> wetbacks. Yeah. They used to beat up the scabs that would they were actually from Mexico that go in there and take those positions from the, the people union, that though. were. Uh, mm -hmm. So on her strike. her presence, her identity flatters whiteness in some way. Oscar wasn't in that business. And they're in essence, they were conformants. Um, yeah, but I think yeah. also at the same time you have people, uh, other Mexican American <coughs> groups who were in the establishment who wanted to ignore someone like Oscar too themselves, you know, and they helped him get buried I can associate in history myself as well. With a fat drunk. Well, yeah, like that fits all the stereotypes <laughs> of Mexicans: fat yeah. drunk. <laughs> well, it's the same as like you know, ask a Mexican not. Uh, covering you when you won last comic standing or talking about it. And yeah, what time do the guy that goes? You're no, you don't this fit guy that, that, This guy that had a, 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 a series on Ali at the OC Weekly. OC Weekly. It was called Ask a Mexican. And one time uh, when I won last comic standing, I told Lisa, you know, you should email that guy. I said, want to do a little article about a Mexican winning last comic standing. No response, nothing. Like, I, I guess I didn't fit the four years of graduating college <laughs> criteria, and, and yeah. a degree in Chicano studies. But nah. But here, but here we are now, man, with the main mean? guy right here. I think that a lot of, you know, that's what they call respect well, scared, respectability politics. They were trying to get, appear to be respectable in the eyes of, of whites and in the eyes of each other. I mean, went to people, I went to people for money. This woman who used to be the head of Maldef, uh, and Oscar was a lawyer for Maldef. And I asked her, can you finish it? She wanted nothing to do with Oscar Costa. Wow. So there was a whole bunch of those fancy uh, Mexican-Americans of that generation that just turned their back on Oscar. Most of them did. Because until, until Trump started coming around and they realized, oh man, we've given up way too much. And so maybe yeah. we can be, make use out of Oscar in terms as a, as a rebellious figure. Because they had forgotten how to fight. I mean, a lot of that generation. Oh, they're making money now. The oh, they're, 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 in the, yeah, they're in the chips. <laughs> the Democratic Party forgot how to fight, too. We're, oh. They're a bunch of wimps, too. The, the, guy that, the guy that founded the National Council of La Raza, he sent his kids like Andover, the, oh, like yeah, the yeah. best schools wow. and stuff. So they turned, they turned I, the Chicano hustle into you know, elite status. I had a chance to go to that school, by the way. When I, when I was in, when I was in um, Osorino Junior High School, everybody applied <laughs> for four different private schools, and that's the one that said yes to me. But since I was like living in the housing projects, I was trying to explain to my mom, no, ¿para qué vas a ir hasta tan lejos? <laughs> like, no, she just turned me off. Really? Probably wouldn't have been here, bro, if I went to Andover. <laughs> you you, well, you're right. You, you probably have a haircut. I would have been, <laughs> I, I would have been a conservative motherfucker right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, my mom and dad. You, you'd be no, killing you'd it. In that case, you'd be loving it. I, yeah, man. So that was crazy. You mentioned that you'd have a Tesla too. Yeah, man. <laughs> you could have a you're, Tesla. You're hitting on other. I would have uh, started Pornhub, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's why we're showing this film after it gets over the PBS yeah. run, by the way. 
So, <clears throat> so you're right with what you just said right now. Yeah, I think I'm right yeah. most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you did a documentary with George Lopez too, right? Yes. Uh, green is the new George. brown. Brown is, brown is brown the new is green. New green. Sorry. Bar- brown no, is the new green. Are you know George? Oh yeah, we know yeah, him. We know cool. You know him well? Uh, not well. So well. Do you know him well? Yeah. What do you think of George? He took you to Dodger Stadium. No, he took you to Houston. Oh, cool uh, Astros. St- Astros. Yeah, I like George. He took you to the World Series. George yeah. is, and George. I've always liked him. He's a funny motherfucker. Hell man. yeah. Next time I'm asking for two tickets. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, no, I, we, we, we met him in uh, 2000 no, when he was hosting Que Locos. Yeah. He was killing him. He's bro. been good to you too? Yeah. yeah. That's good. Yeah, see, he's been good to Felipe, and so a lot of people say, "Oh, he doesn't help other Latino comics." Sure, he, he does. does he no, help, George he is real. I think he just George doesn't is help selective. all of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, was, like, you gotta was, be yeah. selective sometimes. There was this whack ass comedian named Cisco, and uh, he was crying, right? That George, like, he kept me, kept, kept me emailing and tweeting George Lopez on Twitter over and over like a big pussy because this guy is a big pussy, and um, he goes. Hey man, how can you don't help all the rasta? How can you don't help all the rasta? How can you don't do this? How can you don't do that? How can you don't do this? And then um, and then I, I then I email that piece of shit guy and I say, listen, bro. How come you gonna bother this guy? You know why should he? Do do you st- go check um Seinfeld's uh, Twitter right now? Who has who has go see how many Jews are begging right now? <laughs> <laughs> how many Jews are asking for more money for the rabbi, bro? Homeboy's go, too go, busy go working. Go check Chris bro. Rock, bro. How many people are asking him for money right now? It seems like it seems like it's it like a, a a Chicano or a Mexican American or a or a Cuban guy or a Peruvian guy cannot be successful without fucking people leeching, like or saying like, they're not oh, doing enough. Oh, yeah. you're not doing nothing for la raza, bro. Me being up here is doing a lot for la raza. Fuck yeah. For me, like even when people say that, oh, Paul Rodriguez never did nothing in that. That piece of shit comedian saying that George never did nothing. Let me tell you, man, his presence is doing enough. Just like Black Panther. Black Panther's presence is doing a lot for a young African American who never had um who never thought he could be a superhero. Now he thinks, yeah, man, I could be a superhero. Oh hell yeah. I'm you, not just black man. You see a dude like, like George Lopez. Or, or black dynamite. It's mm-hmm. brown and shit, and he's up there representing yeah, like, well, George destroying it. And one thing shit. that that, Beautiful, that, dude. that uh, Rodrigo Torre mentioned about George Lopez. Is that um, he gives hope for a lot of people because Fuck he's yeah. dark. He's a dark mm-hmm. Mexican, he's just not like all dirty. Uh, just like fucking uh, what's the name Oscar. He's a dark fat Mexican. Yeah. He represented us, and, and you know what? And, and George, and everyone, what did you say about there was no way that fool would be famous in Mexico, the way he looks. Who? George. George. Oh no, 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 of course yeah. not. Yeah. But then, but then, and then on top of everything else, when he first busted out, when he got super famous, he was funny as fuck. That's all he cares. That, and that's that doesn't matter. Rodney Dangerfield funny. You know what I mean? Like just like blowing it up. Yeah, I mean the amount of people that come up to you that I've Mediocre, seen come up to you after or shows or say to you on social media and stuff, you make me proud to be Mexican. Like, you, you know, I mean. They find something in you that makes them proud. You and know what, Rasa? But you're not up there preaching. There's <laughs> yeah. many yeah. ways that's to that's imagine this thing, whole thing, dude. You know? Fuck all that. <laughs> Whatever. All hail to George, for real. <laughs> George is good. Right now, right now. He's so Benicio del Toro, he produced your, mo- your, your movie? Um, um, Benicio. Del Benicio del Toro. Toro. What did I say? Yeah. Del Toro. <laughs> Look at him. He just laughed at you. No, no, me. but uh, she, you did say Benicio Del Torres. Yeah, that I was, was a little fun. confused. <laughs> See that face? That face right there. That's oh, the, Luke Torres, all right? <laughs> Luke Torres with a leather vest. Oh, my God, dude. Benicio yeah, Benicio stepped him. in and was was. So great. you went to Berkeley? I Philip? went to Berkeley's undergrad, yeah. Undergraduate? Yeah. My first ever comedy show was in Berkeley. Where at? And um, for some students. I got booked for $150. No, I, I, I was so excited, I didn't even ask, is there a hotel? <laughs> and um, it was for a guy, named, his name was Killer. Killer. And I performed, And man. Killer was a student? Yeah. <laughs> there was no microphone, just a little lapel. No I, way. He put his, his oh. this guy put his own show together. It had nothing to do with the school. Damn. Nothing, bro. How did it go Come over? My door well, I was funny, man, but then it got cold at night because we had nowhere to stay. Oh, dude. <laughs> did you really have nowhere to stay? It's cold in the bay, bro. No, man. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Berkeley is a great place. How, how, how long have you been doing on uh, I've been, been doing these for about 20 some years, I think. You know, wow. I went to UCLA Film School and then I'm, I figured I, I like this. I, mean, I like, I like, I like kind of documenting real stories. How long did it take you to put this one together? Oh, uh, this one would pop a few years. You know, I've been thinking about it for about twenty years, and and not wanted to, but 
somebody else had the rights or this person had the rights. Some movie actors had the rights. People were trying to make a film about Oscar for many years oh, and wow. unsuccessfully. Because there's, in a traditional kind of conventional Hollywood format, you have to cast a big fat Mexican. And there's no big fat Mexicans who are box office, right? So we had to do it in a way that you didn't, where you didn't need someone that was famous to cast it. You had some of the footage we used of, Oscar, of the real Oscar, and we combine it with performance of someone who's kind of playing Oscar. So, um, yeah, I, I've been wanting to do this a long time. It's been a, kind of a dream come true, and I'm really happy and feel lucky uh, that I got to do this. And you also, with the, your films, you do the, the producing as far as getting the funding and all that? Yeah, I raised the money, yeah. Basically, on top of it being released by PBS, I'm sure they gave you a little bit. Yeah, you know, they the CPB we gave a lot of it. Okay. And I was actually lucky because there was a Chicano from um, San Antonio who was in the position of authority, which never happens. <laughs> and I went to pitch him, and he said, "Zeta, Brown Buffalo." He was, "I got a first edition in my in, in, in my in my home library, and it was, it was fantastic." And so uh, he 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 understood what I was after, and he understood what it was. And I'd gone to other people. They'd say, what the fuck? Who is this fat fucking Mexican? I would, it would've, wouldn't have worked, but it worked. See the, this photo right here that was in your movie? Oh, that's a, that's a great photo. This photo right here? The, that's, from, that's from La Raza collection, right? Mm -hmm. That's my neighborhood right there. No shit? Right there, that's where I grew up. That's the Pico Gardens housing projects. Wow. Right there in that corner, that's where, um, where everything changed. Where, right there where those kids are standing, even though it's like they're doing little protests. Right here, man, where my life changed. How so? I bit someone's ear off right there. <laughs> Did you really? I was on PCP. When, come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell the story about it. I talk the... about it when I, this was where I, my last time I was in my neighborhood, it was right there. The this last is... time I saw it, it was right there where these kids are standing. It's the beginning <laughs> of him becoming a comic. And that's, how a, they... that's a preschool right there. We used to jump in that preschool and jump into the preschool. And um, How did that change? What what happened to you? After oh, I that? got crazy, man. I, was, I got into a crazy fight right there where those kids are standing. Were you really on Angel Dust? Yeah, man. And what does that feel like? Oh man, it feels like um, like, uh, like the Hulk, but was, <laughs> like you're the Incredible Hulk, but you just have no control of anything. <laughs> so you have you incredible have strength, crazy, man. but no you don't. Control. What do you and don't feel coordinated on it? I feel coordinated, like, like oh yeah, man. Oh, when I woke up the next day, I was full of blood. Like, I looked like a Walking Dead. You because you, you've been in conflicts. Shit, huh? Yeah. You don't even feel pain. I don't with feel that no shit. pain, bro. Damn. But the, what happened was you got. That guy came after you, I guess, or you were afraid they were going to come after you. There you go. Well, right. Well, the story, <laughs> yeah. he wants to know that how it changed Oh, what your happened life. was, that guy went to the hospital. He didn't want to press <laughs> charges. Because he, what? this <laughs> um, He didn't want to press charges. He didn't want to press charges, so he said he's going to kill me, I guess, not if he ever sees me again. So fa Father Greg Boyle from Homeboy Industry, sure. he put me into a rehab. And I went to a rehab for about a year. This is before Homeboy existed. This is before and, Homeboy yeah. industry. It was and called because Job for the Future. You were addicted to that stuff? No, I was addicted to crack and violence. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. So how did you get to become a comedian after all that? Oh, when I came on a rehab, um, I went to the library, and I asked the librarian how, to help me find books on comedy writing. And she found me this book called Gene Perez, Comedy Writing Step by Step. Yeah, and then another one, Steve Allen, and no uh, shit. Yeah, well, before that, during rehab though, you made that list yeah. of five things that uh, you wanted to do in your life. It was one of the counselors who was a priest, right? Yeah. He he told you guys to make the f list of five things. He wanted to, he wanted to know like um, write down your five dreams. Yeah. That you want to do. So uh, my first dream was um, wow, I have this dream where I'm holding money, <laughs> and when I wake up, it's gone. <laughs> and another dream where. I'm naked in class. <laughs> then he gave me the list back. He goes, no, 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 not your dream dreams. <laughs> <laughs> your goals. I said, I don't like soccer. <laughs> no, you're, what you want to be in life? Oh, so it was like, I didn't even know what I want to be in life. And I was 20. I have no, so I, first thing I wrote was, I want to be a comedian. Because I, I saw this album of Bill Cosby, my brother Russell, whom I sleep with. And then, um, I want, then I, I love Olive Garden, so I want to go to Olive. I want to go to Italy, and then um, these are hard decisions right here to write down. I have to really Executive think hard. Decisions. And the third one was to be happy. Four and five, I forgot. So when I came on a rehab, I knew that I wanted to be a comedian because I wrote it down. So I said, I gotta push, push, push. So here we are, man. Talking to Philip Rodriguez, that is fucking great. Award-winning. <laughs> 
That was Perry. That was really great. He tells that story on the This Is Not Happening, which is a Comedy Central series, and it's on YouTube. You can find That's it. Ex- but it's really well told in that. Yeah. Are you suggesting it wasn't well told? No, it then? just was condensed version <laughs> here. <laughs> the condensed version. Yeah, here. the other one was. Was that a picture of documentary about Felipe? Yeah. <laughs> 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 A mockumentary about <laughs> Rodrigo Torres, That's the man, the myth, the what? roach killer. That's are there f- are there great Road documentaries killer. about comedians that you that you you like? No, one one yes, yeah, actually it's one. It, it, it was an HBO movie, and it was it was um, narrated by Robert De Niro, and it was on um, Lenny Bruce, and that was good. That's the one I know That's that that was ago. actually based on a comedian. That was a good one. You saw Richard Pryor, what he liked, right? Yeah. The icon ones were good. I like But it. the one with uh I think the one with um Robert De Niro part of the That was real, real really well. Yeah. Oh I gotta see it. And also the that um the Oscar the Oscar Costa Zeta one I saw too was awesome. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well that's the best. Who's one. the actor? <laughs> who who the doctor, who the, the uh j- a- actor is a, a guy named Jesse Celedon and you know, he Where's he from? He's from here. He's from he's from where's he from? He's from like uh what's that place? Bakersfield. Oh, how Bakersfield. Did, how did you miss the casting call for this movie? You know, it's great because he really would have been a great buff. <laughs> because um, he really would have been a great buffalo. No? He oh, is, I am the brown buffalo. I'm going to get that Bull in now. a china shop in our house. <laughs> how do you look in a wife beater? <laughs> oh, he's got a poster. There's a poster of one. <laughs> we, we just, her and I, we dressed up for, we, her and I, we dressed up at Hunter Thompson and Acosta. Oh, yeah, Show were, the photo. That's right. But Jesse Celadon is a great actor, and a guy named Jeff Harms plays uh, uh, Hunter, Hunter Thompson. Hunter Thompson with a good casting, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, went and, uh, and you know, it was fun. Yeah. Do you um, go? You dress up as as Hunter and, and and Oscar? No, we did for Halloween last yeah. year, or two years ago. We didn't do anything last year. The one, if you're in loading, you should find it right there. Check it out. I'm gonna find it. Just keep talking. How long did the movie take to shoot? Uh, it took about what well, we what we did. We it took a month. We um we rented a, a, a mausoleum. We didn't have much money. So there was this mortuary in East LA, and they were really great, and they let us clear the dead bodies out. And we shot on, on a green screen there, and we used the embalming room where they you know, dress up the bodies. We moved those bodies out, and we did the makeup in there. So um, it was a month, and um, then editing takes a while. You know, it takes, you gotta put all this shit together, particularly when you don't know what you're doing, like me. And then we came up with a picture that I really like. Yeah. So, uh, we're uh, we're off and get get seen everywhere. And I'm, I'm happy about it. You shot it on film. Shot it on 4K, which 4K? is uh, yeah, you know, format. So if we were if Not we were right gonna, camera, right? It's the same thing. They're all the same right. now. There's yeah, that was a brand, but it's the same technology ultimately. It's about the lenses and then yeah. So when it, you see it on the big screen, it looks really beautiful. Um, That's what ours was shot. If that was going to be a documentary about you, what would it would it be about your life and about and see you on st- and performance and? I don't know idea. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's how it would be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of offstage stuff. You know what? Felipe is the kind of guy that you can follow around all over LA, and his interaction with everyday people is uh, interesting, just as interesting as anything else he does. So, I mean, working with George was great because you know he <laughs> has a lot of opinions about everything. George is very right, really, right now. You know, he's he's uh he's got a lot of edge, and a lot of rage. And he's a lot of he's very insightful about a lot of things. I'm gonna show you his yeah, he's been around picture there. right now here. Him and Paul in this movie years ago. That's oh my really goodness. <laughs> How's Paul doing? Is he so working? Is he We're working going to Hawaii still? together. He's a good guy. Actually, main part of Giga doing Honolulu. Yeah, this weekend. Neil oh. Blaisdell Theater this when Friday. It, oh, fantastic! Saturday. 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 Yeah. yeah. Oh, great. We worked together a lot. Actually, we were in Tucson last summer with War, Malo, and Tierra. That's real OGs, huh? Real OGs. What's up, fool? We will find your um, find you at you have an Instagram. Yeah, <laughs> but damn, def- wait a second, isn't there a list you know here? What the, the handle is? I don't know the I handles. I don't have it on this. That's all. Isn't on this list. These people. It oh yeah, yeah. Here that. it is. Oh my. Brown Instagram. Buffalo. Instagram. Brown Buffalo Film. <laughs> I was guessing it is. Brown <laughs> Buffalo Film. Brown Buffalo. Please film. find us on Instagram at Brown Buffalo Film. And on Facebook at Brown Buffalo Film. Uh, uh, and um, when you're in the movie, was Oscar prom queen in that photo? No, he was prom. He was dating the prom. Ki- yeah, I think he. You know, I, he was dating the prom queen. 
And but he, he was arrested, some, right? He for was a, a white chick. Yeah, he like was a big, You know, he was the top of the yeah, class. He was a senior, he was a class president of the junior class, and he was the varsity football, and he was the clarinet kid, and he was the succeeding. He was this fat little Mexican boy. He got himself slimmed down, and he out was very bright. So he went to the top. And he was charismatic. So he became the top of the social heap, and then he wanted to date the little güerita, and he did until her old man said this. Typical La Bamba story, right? <laughs> and, and the old man says, no, 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 you're not. And that really busted Oscar up. Felt anger and shame. And the judge apparently, I don't know how apocryphal these stories are, but the judge says, you know, you can either go to jail or join the Air Force. So then Oscar joined the Air Force where he played in the marching band in Panama. And because all the f other soldiers he was with all the guys in the Air Force wanted to go to the whorehouses because Panama was a real. He, he mentioned that. Like you mentioned, Panama has the highest the rate of syphilis, bro. Of, of, of venereal disease among any American base <laughs> in the world, and Oscar he was just kind of a straight laced kid, so he converted to Baptist religion and he became a Baptist minister, and then he went in out the in the jungle. jungles to convert the natives to Baptist. So he, he became. He wanted to do that, or he did part time. He did, he, I, I, don't, he, I don't know the timeline exactly, but he drops out of the service and he becomes a Baptist and he says, I became the Mexican Billy Graham. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, you know, yeah, and it's unbelievable. I mean, this is all really actually happens. Uh, and then at some point he realizes that it's a crock of shit, that he's selling a white man's religion <laughs> to these poor Indians and <coughs> he feels terrible and he actually tries to jump out of a hotel window. Jumps out of a hotel window in New Orleans and he falls on a car, thankfully, and he doesn't die. And he says, I'm quitting God, right, as of this day. And then he's lost again. So he kept, he was bipolar, right? So he was get all really high and really get excited about stuff. And there was no medication, there was no diagnosis. He didn't even know what he had. He couldn't address it in any way. He just kept, but he kept on trying, looking for truth, for peace, and then he'd medicate himself. When once the 60s hit, and he goes, oh, this is great, because he takes acid like, aspirin <laughs> to try to get his mind straight and in a way he did in a he way to balance bro and balance yeah and, and 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 when he went into his courtroom sometimes his most inspired courtroom uh strategies were he come up with on 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 hallucinogens i like what the other the part where uh that's <laughs> let me see Oh, yeah, that's, that's really great. Yeah, that's you so wore great. no shirt, no undershirt. Um, so. I like that part where you mentioned that um, that um, that fool beat one that one. He goes, but then that fool liked the camera because he was always in the news, right? Like, like he was Johnny Cochran before Johnny Cochran. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. And um, and actually do fighting the same the, the same the same kind of cr law against the police, but then he said, um, but he'd be speaking and looking for the most interest Chicana in the room. <laughs> Work in the room, man. One time, right? one time. He was he, a player, right? You know, he was a player. So one time, he's in a courtroom, and what, he sees that. What does he love too, bro? He sees a long this, speech. This black woman in the jury box, <laughs> in, in this kind of nice leg. Yeah, yeah. Like together, like their faces together. Yeah. And he's, you know, he's trying this case, and she's winking at him, and he's winking back, <laughs> and she calls him up late at night one time, and she says, "Mr. Acosta." There's some irregularities in this jury. They're against you, and there's some monkey business. So, you know, he spends a night with her. They, they're, they're doing the deed. And in the end, he's able to call a mistrial and get his clients free because he was able to successfully appeal to this black woman who was a juror. So Oscar had, you know, he had wiles. He had, he had game. Crazy, man. But don't, do you think he kind of did a disservice to his the people he was representing to some extent because he's because you know the top oh. thing in a courtroom is respect <clears throat> and he's flying in the face of that kind of Fucking on the edge the but case. over the edge very often but he's messing up the case you could lose cases just based on oh, yeah, respect on your, yeah. your, your attitude i mean i've seen so many attorneys kiss ass like you yeah, have especially when you're on the other side and man. yeah so you when you're desperate to win but maybe that's he was working for free a lot of times so you know i think you'd have to ask each each defendant to see what they thought about it but yeah. certainly in some cases the point that he was trying to pitch to the chicano activist was that 
I'm not just going to here to get you off a case. Right. Or get, this is but, all but, to but make this a is bigger about point. To make yeah. a bigger point, yeah. precisely. We're going to use your persecution as a way to advertise right. the persecution of our of our whole of, of, of the injustice of the system. So these people were ready to take an L the, if, yes, for and, the cause. And, and, and I think, in fairness, very often there were other lawyers. Yeah. There were there were Maldef mm -hmm. lawyers or ACLU lawyers also in the stable. And Oscar became the face, yeah. the front. He was the Johnny Cochran. He right. was the yeah, Cochran, yeah. right? He was the showman. And in doing so, he was able to press the authorities and the police departments and the sheriff department mm -hmm. and, and, and punish them. They didn't like him because he was so effective. And he was, like, he was like a Trumpian figure in that way, right? He's really good on camera. And people want to watch him. He was compelling, like most crazy people are. And he was just something you wanted to see. And so he knew how to press their buttons. So that leads us to the to another episode in his life when he runs for sheriff of Los Angeles County. Yeah, it was funny. He's got no money. He's <laughs> got enough, just enough money for posters and bumper stickers. <laughs> there is no campaign. There's a little office somewhere. There's just the Vato Locos and wh whatever he can come together with, and he gets 100,000 votes. That's crazy. <laughs> and w in doing so, of course, he loses by a million. But he, <laughs> he, he, in doing so, he makes a point. He yeah. uses that platform to make a point about police brutality, yeah. about who the police represent and who they don't. And he gets heard on that platform, so yeah. Absolutely, yeah. and yet, and yet, the Stay fact that the back. guy is a marginal figure in American history, the fact that Latinos <laughs> themselves don't even know about him, yeah. it's astonishing, like what the fuck is wrong? So actually we did a five part podcast in the company to the film that we're gonna put on the, on the radio um, that, that explains a bit more, things more in depth, because I think that Oscar merits uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, people's awareness. And again, if, if, the, if the Rasa doesn't know its own life, its own history, its own story, you're just completely beholden to the storytelling of other groups yeah. that have all the fucking money, yeah. that have all the d distribution capacity, that have all the publicity orgy they can throw at you to, to buy into their, their interpretation of reality. And that doesn't serve us. Because they got an agenda. Storytelling always has an agenda, right? Yeah, man. Comedy always has an agenda and has a point of view and has an experience it comes from. It's not just sui generis. It comes out of a historical experience. Lenny Bruce very decidedly came out of a place. And so you, and it's important as you're ingesting entertainment, as you're ingesting comedy, as you're ingesting story that you know what is the fucking agenda here? Who, in whose interest is that I fucking chuckle here? <laughs> Because I might be chuckling at my own goddamn expense, and that's usually the case, right? Yeah, man. I mean, there's a reason that the people on top that have a lot of fucking money, and there's a reason that people are eating shit on the bottom. And uh, there's a lot of reasons for it, but one of them is how narrative gets organized, distributed, made, approved, written about, reviewed. It's an apparatus of, of and I don't mean this in a paranoid way, in a conspiratorial way, but it's an apparatus of, of cultural control. So... This must be challenged, and we must have people that are aware and awake and be able to speak to this issue of media literacy. Come on, kids. Who, what the fuck are you ingesting? You know? What's up with you? What you want to add? Nothing, man. That was fucking uh, great, dude. Thank you very much for doing that and uh, actually bringing the story to light. <coughs> and hopefully, um, you know, many so more uh, people. March 23rd. Mm -hmm. 23rd. 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 On PBS. 9 p.m. 9 p.m. And no Oscar story. How much uh, research did you do? How much? An infinite time? amount of research. A lot. Like, you know, a lot. A lot. You know, we had a great team of writer David Ventura and and, and people, uh, Alison Sotomayor, the producer, and we dug in and we found everything we could find. Talk to people, call people that hated him. Had people hang up on you. His ex-wife, his brother, his ex cuñado, his ex cuñado, who hated the motherfucker. He said he killed my sister, gave her hepatitis, and you know, <laughs> from his needle, his needle use. So, I mean, you know, I mean, it was great. It was a great adventure. Very, and, it's like an Easter egg hunt. And what happened to him, uh, essentially? What Very, great question. It's, an, it's, a, it's a mystery. Right. There was no trace of his body ever found. There was no record. I mean, that's from, it was Sinaloa, Mazatlan, mm -hmm. right? And this is then, but these are proto-narcos. And he was doing, you know, he says he was going to go make a deal. And I think Mota, at least, Coca, probably, gun here or there. <laughs> Um, he wanted to come back on a boat from Mazatlan to the Bay Area to do some business. He was talking about trading arms. He was talking about 
making a revolution against Nixon, about the, against the United States of America, with the Mexican revolutionaries and the Vato Locos. Wow. So, you know, he had big, he had big dreams. He had big <laughs> dreams. Very little foundation, but big <laughs> dreams. And somewhere, it's not what I've done. It's what I'm going to do. maldito. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so uh, we don't know, and that's great too. Yeah. Yo, you know, Twitter, Philip. I do. What is it? I have a Twitter <laughs> called Brown Buffalo PBS. <laughs> B- Brown. Everybody follow Brown Buffalo PBS. Yeah. On Twitter. Yeah. On Twitter. What's up, fool? Yeah, man. That's crazy, bro. I didn't know none of this stuff. It's really nuts, dude. All that stuff he did. I mean, and from you know, from where he came from, El Paso, to you know. Yeah, like right now everybody's talking. Everybody, everybody's all about memes, bro. Like they're protected <laughs> with all these memes, but no one's stepping up and saying, "You know what, eh? I'm gonna represent some of these DACA guys for free." Oh yeah, man. When you where's that lawyer stepping up, eh? I think the, some of them have done. Yeah, there's, there's free clinic. Some donation <laughs> yeah, movements. There's, there's some, you know, Maldef is great. This guy Tom Signs that runs Maldef is a must and going. He should he should be on the show. I don't know much of the sense of humor he has, but he's a mar- <laughs> <laughs> That's what makes some of these. He's tough. a fantastic <laughs> guy. You better dress well, cause we'll laugh at his sweater. <laughs> no, he's a fantastic guy. Um, sweater with a sweater full do of you, cats. When you're out there in the audiences, do you see that? Politics are changing. Do you get a sense that people are more restless or they're crying angry? babies, bro? <laughs> Tell me, a bunch of snowflakes out there crying. I mean, they don't take it personal. They take it too personal. Like, if, like, like, I always tell people, like, when if, when they write about me, I tell them, don't write my jokes on paper. It's not the same. People need beers. People need to come from doing something crazy, like a bad, like from a horrible job, to sit down and to listen to me. And, and do my comedy, and I'm saying everything they think, but don't want to say because they don't want to lose their jobs. I'm doing it for them, so I'm never gonna I'm never gonna censor myself. That, that's that. my impression of a lot of these people that they have a lot of afraid of their own shadow. They're afraid to sp- say something offensive to their boss. I get yeah. I get a lot of yeah. I have friends that are like professors. I don't want to start a problem, bro. I've been working here for a long time, bro. You just started here. I got a mortgage. You know, you know what? <laughs> Isn't that isn't that the case? Yeah. This it seems like a lot of cowardness, a cowardice. A lot of people turn into their parents. Yeah. I can't, hey bro. I, I, I like when people say, bro. I, like I don't understand. Like uh, they, I can't um, I can't do that no more, bro. Because I got a job for Disney now. Bro, but but you, you, all your cartoons were political before. <laughs> now they're all bullshit. Yeah. You know, I, I got a job for Disney, bro. I can't I can't be political no more. I feel like that you see a combination <laughs> of things. You see at your shows. Uh, the, the portion of these social justice warriors who come down on him, it's very small. It's just a, a smattering. But it's an indication that this is what this younger generation is talking about and is thinking. Every, they're triggered by certain words and phrases without hearing the whole thing, you know, or understanding how this could also open doors to communication, you know, or, story, or uh, conversation, discussion yeah. about these issues. Um, the comedy is another way at that. But um, I also see people who are burned out by any discussion on any side of politics, and they want a place to go where they don't have to hear it. And that's what happened with the last election. Yeah, no matter what they believe or who they support or don't support, they don't want to hear. They want a place where they can go and escape that um, discussion for a while. You know, it's in their face on Facebook, and they're fighting with their aunt about something on. Twitter, fighting you know, with bots. Like, fighting with bots. I know, right? And you get so incensed, and then you just need a little place to go. A where time it's out not, of mind. Yeah. But, but there is a catharsis that happens <laughs> in your shows, right? They're 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 letting something off. They're yeah, letting some steam off, yes, right? Definitely. And how do you understand that? What are they? What are they? They buy they? T-shirts. <laughs> well, he made you meet with all your. Fans I meet them, yeah. Most of the time. I meet them. Some of these they bigger, bigger. How do you deal with like? people who see you as a hero and when they look at you and they're all starry-eyed and shit. Is that a creepy feeling? Is that a good feeling? What does that feel like? I go, man, how much, how much, how much coke did this guy do tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Why is he still holding on to me? <laughs> You're a, he's my hero, bro. I, I, you, you, you let go of coke and you became somebody. And I go, yeah, bro, you could do it too, bro. <laughs> You're going to be a comedian, but you could become somebody too, bro. Put the pipe down. <laughs> go watch your kids. Go for a walk. <laughs> Teach your kids how to play guitar. Show them a little chord. Show them two chords, bro. <laughs> dun, dun. In a solo. <laughs> dun, dun, the end, just the ending. <laughs> so, you're, so um, who did you look up to in, in uh, oh, that's films? Oh, great. Film, in, I don't know, a whole bunch, you know. My, I was, my, my dad was from South Central, and he was a poor kid, but he was kind of a loner, and 
and very, but he was bookish. So uh, and after the Korean War, he served in the war in the army, and then he got a GI Bill, so he got a house, and he got to, we had to go to he had to be able to go to college, and the federal government paid for it in those days, so he was able to go to UCLA, and and he was because he was smart and he was isolated, a very solitary person. He read a lot, and then he also watched movies a lot, and he listened to music a lot. So I had this great benefit of this father that had very kind of working class poor origins, and he was always haunted by that, but also had a lot of interests, and movies were one of them. So as a boy, you'd take me to the art, those days it was the art houses, there was no cable TV, there was three channels, for Christ's sakes, you know? And take me to the art houses and watch the movies, and to watch the French movies, and the Buñuel movies, and it was great. So by the time I get to 15, and I start seeing Spiel, Steven Spielberg, I was like, get the fuck out of here with that. I wanted nothing to do with it. I didn't understand what was going on. It was like popcorn sales, man. It was dead, flat, <laughs> was like, lifeless, e. phony. <laughs> get the fuck out of here with that. I, I, was, I was out, and I just didn't relate. Didn't want any Star Wars. I didn't understand what was going on. It was, to me, like a fucking hustle. I felt like a, a capitalism was so efficient, and juggernaut trying to sell me goddamn merchandise. <laughs> and I said, that's not what I want to do. And so I did something that's much less remunerative, but to me, turns me on. It gets me excited, makes me want to do it. And so that's what I've been after. Good for you. Yeah, man. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. What's, What's up, Full Podcast with Philip Rodriguez? Yeah, in the house. Very Brown interesting. Brown Buffalo film on Instagram. And go watch the movie, man, on PBS. It'll be on 8 o'clock, March 20th. Nine o'clock, mm-hmm. March twenty fourth. It'll be on for a while, right? March twenty third. Yeah, it'll be on that day. Then it'll be on P- PBS uh, d- digital. So PBS oh, dot cool. org or something yeah, like that. Well, Jigo, any shows coming up besides Hawaii? Nah, in April. Where? That's about that. In uh, Whittier, Nipah. Is that anything coming up? I dishes. Have Toby Hicks. I have dishes. dishes. Nice. April thirteenth. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> no, I don't have fucking dishes. <laughs> I have a lot of shit, and part of it is doing your books and everything that you uh, take for granted every day. That's funny. And your business. <laughs> and your podcast. <laughs> and your live shows. Do tell. He. <laughs> the other night, before we go, the other night, like, she told me, man, I lost 10 pounds. I lost 12. 12 pounds. Since January 1st. They're, they're, they're in the middle of the night. I made her the the best grilled cheese ever. So. <laughs> he did. He sabotaged me. <laughs> <laughs> it was good, man. It was delicious. <laughs> Vegan grilled cheese. What's up, fool <laughs> podcast, man? Everybody, man, thank you for listening. Thank you for all your comments. I I read them sometimes, you know. I know a lot, a lot of you guys are truck drivers, and you 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 listen to our you learn a lot of stuff. And you follow the stuff that we list that we mentioned here, man. A lot of people actually do listen and go to get the stuff that we mentioned here. Like, actually, somebody signed up for your acting teacher's class. Yeah, she signed her daughter. Up. Yeah, uh, yeah, one of our listeners goes to a state <laughs> acting class. She sent her daughter. To we it. had a little meeting greet, bro, in the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get a selfie. And people did buy that book, bro. The one that Dee Miller Town wrote about Cat Williams. And they're going to go check out your, your movie. And, and also that other book, Random Family. Random that Family. People love that. What's up, fool? Philip Rodriguez. Thank Tell you. Tell us something before you go. I, I really had a good time here. <laughs> I, can I come back? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Anytime. Thank you very Thanks. much. Love to have you back. What's up, fool? Shout out to the, 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 the wheel of the steel over there. Emma. Emma. Yeah, man. Let's take a photo over here. Did your dad know a lot of other Mexican-Americans? Yeah, probably.